Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with a jazz trombonist specializing in the New Orleans blend, Jerry Zygmunt. Over the course of our conversation, we discussed his childhood in Connecticut and his start with music at the age of 12. From there, he would begin playing in clubs and with luminaries like celebrated British clarinetist Sammy Remington and the New Orleans Jazz Cats Doc Cheatham, Percy Humphrey, and Arville Shaw. For the past 20 years, he has been playing in the Woody Allen New Orleans Jazz Band at the Carlisle Cafe in New York City, and that has opened the door to him playing in spots all over the world. We discussed his passion for playing jazz along with much more. Dig this interview, my friends. Jerry, thank you for taking some time to talk with us here at Neon Jazz tonight. I appreciate it. Sure. What has been going on lately as far as jazz activity, gigs, anything that's been going on? For going on 20 years now, we play almost consistently at the Carlisle every Monday night. And that's a standing gig that we've had for uh, going on 20 years now. Next Monday, I'll be at the Carlisle. <laughs> and that's pretty much my musical identity at this point. Let me ask you about growing up in Connecticut. How did you get into music? And more specifically, how did you start garnering a love for jazz? Well, my dad was a big jazz fan growing up. And when he was younger, he played a little bit of string bass and he grew up in the Connecticut area, Bridgeport, Connecticut area, and he was able to see a lot of the big bands. He came in on the tail end of that era, so he would go to places like the Pleasure Beach Ballroom, and he would get to hear Duke Ellington and see Louis Prima. So he kind of grew up with a love for jazz, and especially trombone, of all things, you know. And there were a lot of real hot, very well-respected uh, trombonists on the scene at that time. Kai Winding and J.J. Johnson were touring together, and uh, sometimes just as a duo, and then they would get together a trombone quartet and sometimes a trombone octet. And so he had the pleasure of being close enough to New York to go out and hear some of these trombone giants and just grew to love the instrument. And when I was growing up, he wanted to put one in my hands as soon as he can. So I believe in third grade, I started playing valve trombone because my arm wasn't quite long enough to make all the positions on the slide. You know, I kind of took to it. When I finished up with high school, I went on to music school and got a degree in music education. Really thought that maybe that was going to be my calling, be a music teacher and maybe play a little bit of gigs on the side in the you know, greater Connecticut area. The trombone doesn't seem like a common instrument for a kid to gravitate to. What was it about that instrument that really lured you? Well, I think, you know, there was always music in the house, whether it was classical music or I grew up in the 60s, so my dad was playing things like, you know, Joan Baez. And at the same time, he was playing things like, um, you know, J.J. Johnson and Kai Winding. And so those more contemporary forms of jazz uh, really spoke to me. And I really uh, enjoyed the instrument itself and listening to those recordings. So, th so that was a big influence. And then as I grew up, I had the opportunity to hear some trombone giants live. I got to hear Irby Green at least a couple of times live, uh, Bill Watrous a number of times. And uh, going through high school, I followed bands like the Maynard Ferguson Band, and Stan Kenton was still alive and touring at that time. So I, I really got steeped in some of the history of the big band era, but also followed a lot of contemporary big bands that were out there. In your lineage, you've been in marching bands, drum corps, bands, quintets, orchestras over the years. Was playing in front of a crowd ever something to you that made you nervous? Is it a comforting thing? What do you get out of playing for a crowd live? Well, when I was younger, I was terribly nervous. When I was going to music school and we would have to do recitals or convocations and perform, and I would have to play the printed page, you know, I was I was one step away from having tremors and not being able to perform the music at all. I think jazz has always been a very freeing, very spontaneous art form in and of itself. And somehow when I was playing uh, jazz um, in any context, I, I didn't have those... Um, nervous jitters that you would be playing uh, classical music. Talk to me about how that happened, how you gravitated towards the New Orleans blend. Give me an idea of those beginnings and how you started performing live. Sure. Well, when I was in college, I had uh, the opportunity to perform down in Hartford, Connecticut, and there were a number of bands that were performing live. This was still uh, early 80s, so there was definitely enough budget in the club scene to pay for a live band. We weren't quite into completely recorded music. And I noticed an advertisement in a local uh, 
weekly circular where someone was looking for a, a jazz trombonist to play New Orleans jazz. And at that time, I probably had very, very little exposure to anything other than maybe Louis Armstrong's Hot 5 and Hot 7 recordings. So I went down to this club in Hartford and sat in with his band, and it was completely improv. They weren't reading off charts, and they were playing very, very simple head arrangements, very much in the spirit of something like the Preservation Hall Jazz Band. And I went down there that night, and a couple other trombonists sat in and and did their best to improv. And at that time, I probably you know had a really good ear, but didn't have a lot of experience just doing improvisation. So I did the best I could, and they called me a couple weeks later and said, you know, we'd like you to be in the band. The bar for requirements weren't, wasn't really that high, so, um, but I qualified and, and was convincing enough for them to sort of give me a shot at it, and then once I started working with it regularly, they kind of loaded me up with a lot of cassette tapes and uh, recordings of a lot of these uh, New Orleans artists that had come through the ranks, either uh, had been there during the beginnings of jazz um, and played, or lesser lights that kind of came to the attention of jazz aficionados as New Orleans jazz sort of had a rebirth in the 40s. And so a lot of these musicians who were maybe unrecognized when jazz first took off had another chance at sort of building another career once this New Orleans revival sort of hit in the 40s and the 50s. So talk to me a little bit about your time with British clarinet as Sammy Remington. What was that like? So I had the opportunity in the 80s to work with this British clarinet player named Sammy Remington who had cut his teeth with bands like the Chris Barber Band and Ken Collier during some of the uh, skiffle groups and out of that emerged in in Great Britain a real New Orleans revival in the 60s and so Sammy was one of their talented clarinet players and he has currently an ongoing career playing New Orleans jazz and so we brought him over from uh, Great Britain to the United States, and we were able to connect with him before he actually went down regularly. He made a pilgrimage to the New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Festival and would perform. So we were able to hook up and do some concerts with him in New England. Well, and then also there was a mention that you've performed with legends like Don Cheatham, Percy Humphrey, and Arvel Shaw. What was that like? Well, that was a special project that was put together, again, by that concert promoter in Connecticut, by John Russell. It was his desire to put together a band and perform at Sweet Basil, which was a really great jazz club in Greenwich Village, and a lot of real well-known jazz artists had performed there. And Doc Cheatham actually held court every Sunday and were, would perform at a jazz brunch. So we got Doc on board to play a couple of sessions that we ended up recording, and we invited in Arvel Shaw, who, of course, had a real distinguished group with career playing with Louis Armstrong's All-Stars. It was a wonderful experience to work with these legends. So then we get to today. For the last 20 years, you have performed at the Carlisle in New York City with Woody Allen and the band. What has that experience been like? I mean, that has to be, I mean, we're talking two decades, a regular kind of a gig. How did that start? How enjoyable is that? Well, when we were doing some of those concerts with Sammy Remington, who I mentioned earlier in the conversation, we were playing at a club down in Greenwich Village, and a whole bunch of his band members back in the 90s came down. Woody's been playing New Orleans jazz for a very, very long time. And he had a well-established band that was playing at a restaurant on the east side called Michael's Pub. And so that Michael's Pub band came down and checked us out. And the regular trombonist who was named... Um, and the regular trombonist, Dick Drywitz, who had been working with Woody for years, heard me play and he said, look, we got a lot of great trombonists here in New York City, but nobody really kind of captures that early New Orleans feel like Woody likes. But I'm hearing you and I'm, I think he would really take to your playing. Would you be interested in coming in and filling in for me when I can't play at Michael's Pub? So I was absolutely thrilled to be asked. That's how I sort of got my start, my introduction to uh, playing with Woody, and from there, what happened was in 1996, he took a band out on tour, and they they recorded a documentary, a video documentary called Wild Band Blues, and the core of that band still remains today uh, playing at the Carlisle. The trombonist that's in that film, Dan Barrett, a really wonderful trombonist, when they returned from that tour back in 96, Dan Barrett moved back to California, where he's originally from, and they asked me if I would like to come in and 
be a regular member of the band. So it's been a great ride uh, for us. We play regularly, at, as you mentioned, at the Carlisle every Monday night. And we started back in 96. And we have the opportunity to tour from time to time. So we played all over Europe. We've played also in uh, Istanbul. We've done a little bit of touring all through France, all through Spain. And it's been a really unusual experience because normally when you play something like new orleans jazz where it's a little bit more esoteric and doesn't necessarily have a large drawn audience is because of the popularity of woody allen we have really had the opportunity to play on some of the grand concert stages of europe we've played at uh teatro la fenice in venice and we played at la scala in rome we've played at the vn uh, jazz festival which is a, a roman amphitheater out in uh, Vienne, France, uh, just just uh, sort of these places that you couldn't possibly imagine ever performing. And, uh, you know, I've been lucky and fortunate enough to have played on those stages a number of times, so it's been pretty thrilling. Yeah, that has to be an amazing feeling to not only be outside of America, but to be in these pantheons of historical uh, stature that's huge, to look out there and see those people that love the music. What's that like? It's pretty thrilling for us. Woody is uh, revered uh, in a lot of parts of Europe, so he's he's a celebrity just about no matter where he goes. So a lot of people show up not really knowing what they're going to hear. They they're aware that he plays in a jazz band and they don't know what he sounds like in clarinet, and maybe they're expecting something to sound like Benny Goodman. And so for the most part, I think that they're surprised by this old timey style of music that their their ears are not necessarily accustomed to hearing but uh we managed to win them over time after time so it's been a it's just been a really really thrilling experience to play for many many different types of people so let me ask you on a personal level here from just jazz we're talking new orleans and you mentioned from the trombone kai winding and jj johnson what musicians have really swayed you and and made you really want to be a a, a jazz player so again i mentioned when i was growing up and i got a chance to hear some of these really wonderful trombonists like irby green and it's a real big leap from irby green to jump back and to listen to somebody like kid ori or jim robinson and so when i was first playing with this new orleans jazz band in college and they were expecting me to uh play in a much more earlier style than what my ears and what i kind of favored at that time um, listening to. So th- that was really hard for me at first to kind of wrap my head around. It's almost like I, I use the comparison to ha- t- tasting scotch. And maybe you take your first sip of scotch and it, and it kind of tastes horrible to you and you really can't understand why everybody <laughs> likes it so much. And you kind of go back and you need to revisit it. And it, so it took me a little bit of, it took a lot of maturity and a lot of time to kind of go back and really hear the essence of what people were finding in this early these earlier forms of jazz so i think that there's a certain level of maturity and a certain amount of experience and you know some people some younger people can hear it and instantly they're captured by it and for me it took me a little bit longer to kind of get there and really gain a a full appreciation of these uh, early artists so let me whittle this list down here and kind of get to a crux in a kind of fantastical way here if you could get into a jazz delorean the immaculate time machine and go back and see a performer who would you go see and where would you go to see it oh without question it would be going back to chicago right around 1922 and hearing uh king oliver's jazz band in lincoln gardens with a very very young louis armstrong playing second trumpet to the king honor dutre on trombone just these wonderful wonderful musicians uh woody's soon to be wife lil uh harden was on piano uh, baby dodds was on drums johnny dodds was on clarinet that's the band i would have wanted to hear without question so we kind of get down to this point here. This is my final question. It's simple, but it, direct, it, it has a punch to it. Why do you love jazz? Well, I think I love jazz because it, it's a creative outlet for me. I, I, I mentioned that jazz for me is a bit of an avocation these days. By day, I uh, do something completely different. I'm actually an Apple consultant, and um, they, they 
people say that there's a correlation between music and computers. I'm not sure if that's exactly true. Um, so for me, you know, to, to play regularly at such a high level and with a, in such a high profile job, it's just a thrill and it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful opportunity that I've had all these years. And what I love about it is it's very freeing. It's very spontaneous. So what's great about the New Orleans repertoire is we're drawing off of over maybe 500 songs. And, and granted, you know, these are not complex arrangements like the Fletcher Henderson band would play. Um, but we, uh, you know, a lot of them are head arrangements. Some of them are just pop songs of the day, New Orleans spirituals, New Orleans hymns. We can go for weeks and not repeat a song. And if we do ever repeat a song, it's it's always different. That's beautiful. I mean, that's what jazz is all about. And you'll probably find that with, with any, any style of jazz, is that just how different the same composition can be night after night. Um, so I, I love the spontaneity of it, and I love the, the free aspect of it, that it's just completely uh, open to um, how you feel. That's a perfect way to wrap things up. Jerry, thank you for taking some time to talk with me on jazz. You gave me a great overview and a, and a great look into what you're doing, what the band's doing. I really appreciate it. Well, it's my pleasure, Joe. You, you have a lovely uh, array of uh, extremely... Uh, talented and well-respected musicians and it's an honor to just be asked to even chat with you for a few moments so thank you for having me thanks for listening and tuning in to yet another neon jazz interview where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players in new york kansas city and spots all over the world giving fans all that jazz and thanks to jerry for his love of jazz and keeping that new orleans blend alive and thriving if you want to hear more interviews go to famous interviews with joe domino on the itunes store or visit the neonjazz.blogspot.com for all things neon jazz until next time, enjoy the music, my friends. Neon Jazz.